Hi, this is Ken McCarthy of Jazz on the Tube, and anybody who's been a regular listener, viewer, follower of Jazz on the Tube knows that we love New Orleans. And every chance we get, we want to remind people what a great place it is, uh, how important it is to visit, whether you've been there before or not. It is uh, contrary to some people's strange, misguided notions. It is not still underwater. There are actually people that believe that. No, it's 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 on dry land, and the music is better than ever. Uh, in fact, my friend Ned Sublet thinks the music scene in New Orleans right now is as hot as the music scene was in New York City in the 70s, which is very hot indeed. And today we have a book that we're going to talk about. It's called New Atlantis, Musicians' Battle for the Survival of New Orleans by John Swenson. And I just want to start this whole process off by saying, get the book. Get it, one for yourself. If you've got a friend who loves music, who loves culture, who loves travel, who loves history, get it for them as a present. Get it for your local library. Nothing will put a bigger smile on your librarian's face than to see a really good book come in the door. And this is a great one. This, is chron this book chronicles one of the most amazing stories in music history, one of the most amazing stories in mankind's experiment with urban living history and really human history. It's the, the saving and the salvation and the rebuilding of a city that was almost wiped off the map by a federal disaster, not a weather disaster, but a federal disaster, levee failures. And the heroes of this story are people near and dear to all our hearts, musicians, uh, not exclusively, but largely jazz musicians. And John and I are going to get into this in detail in a, in a second, but just as an overview, make no mistake, it was the, the musicians of New Orleans coming back, going through unbelievable hardships to, to relight the, uh, the, the, the spark of New Orleans that got that city back on its feet. I mean, obviously a lot of people contributed, but the, the musicians' contribution was essential. So let's welcome our, our distinguished guest, John Swanson. John, are you there? Yes, Ken. Thank you very much for the uh, wonderful endorsement of the book, and by extension, the great comments you made about all of these magnificent human beings who uh, helped bring New Orleans back through the force of their culture. It's one of the, it's really one of the great stories of I mean certainly of jazz history you know if we look at you know we're all familiar with jazz starting as you know sort of in ragtime and you know going through the swing era and the bop era and the hard bop era and the free jazz era and that whole beautiful history and this story has got to be considered one of the most important parts of of the music's history the music rebuilding a city and i just want to give the title again uh for everybody who's taking notes uh, new atlantis uh by john swenson and that's w-s-e-n-s-o-n -S -S first let's give some praise to the publisher of this and this is something that we talked about uh briefly but i think it merits uh some attention tell us about the process of getting a, a publisher to recognize the value of, of this story and who finally stood up and, and, and did it? Um, well, we uh, sent, I, I worked on the proposal for a year because the idea was, I had been covering New Orleans music since well before the flood. Uh, and after, when I returned to the city a couple of weeks after the, uh, the flood, I became obsessed with interviewing the musicians who had, they all had such harrowing tales about what they went through. And as more musicians returned to the city, the, the stories just kept building up and building up. And I realized a couple of things, and uh, it wasn't just another music story. And, it, you know, and the story about what happened in my house in Katrina became a cliche. I, it, but these musicians were literally involved in rebuilding the city. I mean literally re involved in gutting houses, helping rebuild, to uh, build new houses, opening businesses, not to mention playing, playing often for no money, uh, playing without a place to live. And it occurred to me that these stories were too big and too interconnected to fit into magazine articles. And after a while, I realized I had to fashion something larger. So I conceived of this book idea, which there were so many books about Katrina and several outstanding books about the people of New Orleans uh, before, during, and afterwards. Uh, two that come immediately to mind are Zytoon and Nine Lives. But this was a different book. This was about 
the musicians driving the recovery. And it was a difficult concept to sell. Most of the my agent, Sarah Lazen, who's also Ned's agent, you mentioned Ned Sublet earlier. Oh, yeah, okay, yeah. Uh, she sent the book around to a lot of different people, a lot of different publishers, and, you know, we kept getting that Katrina fatigue response, which uh, uh, the book isn't about Katrina. <laughs> it's about what's happened since. Uh, that's, like saying, that's like saying, oh, you know, we've got uh, uh, Mozart fatigue or we've got, you know, ancient Rome fatigue. I mean, this, this is a story for the ages. This is not some little news blip. That's my opinion. <laughs> Well, no, I understand what you're saying. It's just that's that's what we were getting back. And also, I was getting back uh, responses from editors that were just looking at it as another book, music book. Uh, one response that really sticks in my mind is the guy who said, why isn't there a chapter on Sissy Bounce? Now, if you've read the book, you know Sissy Bounce is actually included because it was important. But there, it's not different chapters on the styles of music in New Orleans. It's a story about musicians. So amazingly, a lot of editors just couldn't see what was actually in the proposal. And believe me, I worked hard on the proposal, and the pro proposal says what's supposed to be in the book. Uh, but fortunately, Oxford University Press, a great and prestigious publishing house, signed it to and released it here in the United States and uh, as well as in uh, England and in Canada. And the thing about Oxford that I'm very gratified about is that uh, their track record is to keep things in, in print. And so I'm happy to think that uh, when I'm not around anymore to relate this story to people, the book will be able to inform future generations about what actually happened during this period of time. That's great. That's great. And lest anybody think that because it's published by Oxford University Press that it's that it's a very, you know, dense, you know, hard to read tome. No, this is very beautiful writing, very clear, uh, very accessible. And it's and it is great that that a serious press is putting its weight behind it. So Thank you, Oxford University Press, for recognizing the value of American culture. I'm glad somebody does uh, in the publishing world. Awesome. Let, let, let's let's remember something about the the, the weeks after the the. Well, we use Katrina as shorthand, but I, I just want to. I have to because I'm ValvoodLevies.org, and because I believe this is important, I, I do want to let everybody know that that the storm was nothing. The storm ripped a few uh, shingles off a few roofs. It was the uh, the levee failures, uh, I think 54 different levees failed uh, after the storm as a result of post-storm surges, as a result of bad engineering. This was a man-made, uh, government-made, uh, corrupt businessmen's made uh, disaster. So it could have been completely unnecessary, did not have to happen. So this is just a small shout-out. But let's remember what those original weeks were like. Uh, I remember the dead silence in the city, which was so strange. Yeah, there were no birds, there were no animals, there were no children. The city was deserted. You know, it was occupied by the National Guard, and the only people who uh, were, allowed, were allowed to return were people with, a, you know, who had essential jobs. And a few other people sort of snuck back in. But, uh, and, some of the, and, some, and some of the very first in the city uh, were the sounds of uh, music. Um, oh yes, back. that's well right. As soon as as soon as uh, well, musicians played even before the electricity came back on. But as soon as the electricity came back on, people plugged in and began playing. Uh, Coco Robichaud tells a wonderful story about about sitting there in his car and seeing the the electricity come back on. So uh, uh, he ran he ran into Molly's at the market and. Uh, he uh, he plugged in and started playing. Uh, he played for like six hours, and everybody was dancing on the bar. And there was a curfew back then, but uh, it, the you know the National Guard kind of looked the other way in certain instances. Also, it's interesting you mentioned the curfew and and, and bars because. Uh, Bars turned out to be uh, very important uh, social gathering places, news transfers places, uh, 
finding old friends' places, uh, letting off the steam and, and, you know, trying to deal with the trauma places. They, they turned out to become very important social institutions. The landline at Johnny White's on uh, Bourbon Street, Johnny White's Sports Bar, there are three different Johnny White's, but the one right on the, the corner of, I guess it's Bourbon and Toulouse, their landline never went out. So you could, uh, even when you couldn't reach, you couldn't get into, uh, get through to the city, uh, you could call up the bar at Johnny White's and the bartender would answer. I was, uh, I, I, I hooked up some Irish radio uh, broadcasters to them. It was pretty amusing, actually. Wow. Well, one one story that that stands out for me, and there's, there's so many, uh, but one individual is the uh, irrepressible Glenn David Andrews. Oh my God! Um, me- yeah, member of the Andrews clan, uh, who I believe is inter- is related to the Baptists. And I I've never been able to trace the exact uh, how they're connected, but the Baptists, of course, another the Lasties. I'm sorry, the Lasty family, another right. great New Orleans uh, family. Uh, right. Uh, their uh, grandfather, I believe. Uh, ooh, I'd have to I'd have to go back and look at my notes to trace all of the the family roots there, but. You know, they uh, they all uh, were connected in Treme, and Dr. John remembers uh, going uh, going over there and hanging out, and uh, he saw Trombone Shorty when he was a little kid who uh, playing the tuba when he couldn't even lift it up, just laying down on the floor sideways. <laughs> and but but to go back to Glenn David for a second. His his grandfather was uh, Jesse Hill, uh, the the uh, man who wrote Oop Oop a Two, and uh, also was in Doctor John's first band uh, when he when he took the Doctor John name after working as Mac Rebenack for so long. Glenn David Andrews to me is the star of the book. Uh, of all of the people in the book. His story about being there before the hurricane hit, surviving, surviving, uh, and feeling like he dodged a bullet, like everybody did after the storm passed, and then dealing with the inundation, which uh, affected uh, his uh, grandma's house where he was staying, and then fleeing, he fled to the. Uh, to the projects and he's holed up there and they, they uh, finally had to get out of town because of the evacuation and his story of the of uh, coming back and playing in the square where Tuba Fats had taught him as a young person and um, also his his struggles with with um, his, you know he he had an addiction demon that he struggled with and he battled it and he had ups and downs and he was very depressed and he went into rehab at one point but there were this there was this constant uh, evolution uh where he would he would make two two steps forward and take a couple of steps back and then and then keep going and how I kept running into him over the years and talking to him and relating these stories he he's such a great conversationalist and I often had a tape recorder with me so um it just seeing him talk about his life over the course of these couple of years and then of course having this this tremendous breakthrough which uh, you actually um uh have documented on your site with the Heaven's Gate uh piece that you did with GDA and then uh, you know his sponsorship of the baby boys and the uh the Aints parade which was a just a triumphant moment for the whole Andrews clan and now his presence in in Treme the HBO series Glenn's story is really really a a, a wonderful uh, illustration of the transformation that the musicians could, were able to go through new atlantis musicians battle for the survival of new orleans by john swenson